You'll find the text tonight in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. And it's already been good to be in God's house. Diplomacy departed and dogma has just entered in. Praise God. Aren't you glad to be in America tonight? The land of the free and the home of the brave. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 11 verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? He wrote it in a day when there was a firm foundation under the nation of Israel. The sanctity of the home was established and entrenched very deep in the fiber of humanity. It was still a husband and a wife that was recognized. It was in a good day that he wrote those words. And in a sense, as if it was going to happen, may it happen, if it happens. I guess we could say, uh, as mankind has digressed and the depravity of man has manifested itself like we've never seen before over the generations following that great scripture, we could say when the foundations would be destroyed. And then I guess tonight, without being negative, just being honest, we could say in the year 2008, since the foundations have been destroyed. Since the foundations have been destroyed, what shall the righteous do? I look around, it's not the same America I grew up in. And all of its glory and all of the great blessing of this one nation under God, it's not the place I grew up in. There's been a great plummet of apostasy, a great fall from morality. We're living in, in perilous times. Know this also, perilous times shall come. The prophetic words were penned. Let me say that, know this also, perilous times have arrived. Evil men and seducers have waxed worse and worse. They're lovers of their own selves more than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof, a generic God. Since the foundations have been destroyed, what shall the righteous do? It's a bad time. I do believe that the foundations of the home are under strenuous attack tonight. I mean under strenuous attack. It's, it's, it's become an epidemic divorce. Lay aside same-sex marriage. Lay aside the heinous sin of homosexuality. Just the lax attitude towards marriage and the longevity of that relationship. The vows made before God Almighty. By the way, it's not a vow one to another. You misunderstand that. Those are vows to God Almighty that you make. Among these assembled witnesses. And the witnesses are there to hold you to that promise. But yet today we condone and rationalize. And it's always justified. Especially if it's your kin, it's justified. Or if it's your situation, it's always rationalized. The foundations of the home are destroyed today in America. And they're being demolished worse and worse. The foundations of our government are being destroyed. I'm not trying to be negative, but let's be honest, man. Something's wrong somewhere in America. Oh, Barack Hussein Obama. If that ain't Muslim, I'm a Cherokee Indian, bless God. Amen. I never thought we'd be so excited to see a woman vice president as we are tonight. I do believe usurping authority in that passage pertains to the local church. But there's a principle in the Bible. That men ought to be leaders. There's something wrong in a nation, friend. Something wrong somewhere. Since the foundations have been destroyed, the foundations of our schools are destroyed. 
I'm not down on the young people of America today. I'm down on the teachers in America today. Who would ever thought we would hear of sexual relations between students and, and teachers and them initiating it and long ongoing relationships, illicit affairs. And I'm talking about teachers behind bars for molesting. God help us. Since the foundation have been destroyed, the church is under attack. Now, I know there'll always be a church. Upon this rock I'll build my church, he said. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There always will be a New Testament church. Amen. But there's a whole lot of imitations on the market today. All kind of organ organizations and, and not organisms. Let me say the church of the living God's alive. It's an organism. But we've got a lot of substitutes with these outreach centers and ministries. And amen, friend. Since the foundations, I never get so burdened and bothered when I call, maybe get directions to a meeting and they'll answer the phone, such and such a ministry. God help, what about such and such an independent, fundamental, premillennial, missionary, King James only, slobber slinging, sweat wiping, high blood pressure, Baptist church on the other end of the line. He didn't say upon this rock I'll build my ministry, uh, upon this rock I'll build my parachurch organization. He said upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Thank God for the church. And I'm glad there's a few still around in these last days. But they're under attack. Our correctional system's under failure. When the foundation is destroyed, say what you will, man, we're a warped nation. I appreciate the positive things we mentioned tonight, but let's pull our heads out of the hole now. This ostrich Christianity will put you in a mess. Jeremiah 6.16 6, did say, stand ye in the ways and see. That's observation and ask for the old past. Where is the good way? And walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. He said, see, look, we've been looking around, man, God help. No wonder they, they go back to the penitentiary. They got it better there than they do in the slums where they got arrested in. I guarantee you put a striped suit on them and get them out there busted rocks, dragging a ball and chain, bread and water. Look up in here, bless God. Hey, and fire that lecture chair back up. They won't want to go back. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Hey, hey, I guarantee you it's not rehabilitation that we need. It's discipline that we need. It's a correctional institution. It's there for punishment, bless God. Hey, not a weightlifting course in education. They should have learned that when they was in school, bless God. Hey, man, friend. Would the real American please stand up? God help us. If the foundations be destroyed. When the foundations should be destroyed. Since the foundations have been destroyed. The wisest man ever lived. Pen these words to divine inspiration. Chapter number 12. Page 704 in a Schofield reference edition. He said in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. If the foundations have been destroyed, and I think we could all concur tonight and agree that it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's a long way from the way it has been. And the way it's looking, we're not turning it around too quick. We must first of all propose a question, and we got to be honest when we ask it, is what we're doing right now working? I remember the birth of Christian television. I'm old enough to remember Christian television. 
Man, I'm telling you, there was an excitement even among fundamental circles about having 24-7 Christian television. Man, we're going to have Christian television. It was a talk of our movement. We're going to turn the world upside down. The, prof the prophecy's been fulfilled. We've got the medium of television. Man, everybody's going to hear the gospel. They'll get saved in a few weeks. It's going to turn this world around. Now, we've got several Christian channels. And the church has got more worldly. And the world's getting more churchy all the time. It hadn't worked. Christian education came along. That was going to be the savior of everything. If we can just get some Christian schools, man, that'll solve it. Get our kids out from under that influence. Everybody just take a deep breath and say it'll be all right. Been three decades now, since the 70s. The crime rates escalated off the charts. There's more drug rehab centers tonight. Look up in here. Hey, I'm talking about homes for unwed mothers. Drugs have become an epidemic. We're going to turn the world upside down with a, a new idea. Not to say it might have helped, and in some cases, I'm sure it's been an asset. But Christian television hasn't turned the world upside down. Christian education hasn't turned the world upside down. Foundations are destroyed. What are we going to do? I'll be honest, I've talked to myself a lot. Do y'all ever do that? At least it's an intelligent conversation I have. <laughs> There's been times I said, man, let's just forget it. It ain't getting no better. Things are digressing. We're, we're, we're falling. And, and I look and see the decline even in the aggressive soul winning churches. And I say, man, what are we going to do? I turn on Fox News. That ain't much help. And CNN's a lot worse. Say amen right there. Man, I'm telling you, I sink in depression. I think of the future of my children. I think of the great commission that's been given and how it seems we're falling further away from fulfilling that great commission. And by the way, that commission ain't changing anytime soon. It's been given and it's been given for the full length until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Here we sit tonight, 2008. What are we going to do? Do you ever look at your wife and say, what are we going to do? I know some of you already got it figured out, but for the rest of us, we need the Bible to guide us along the way. We don't have to call up some institution and get their advice. We don't have to call some doctor and get his opinion. But here the word of God gives us, I believe, a prescription from the scripture, what the righteous can do. He says in verse 13, and look at it real quickly, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He's writing this, obviously, about this book, this individual book of a compiled 66. But may I add, the conclusion of the whole matter winds up in Revelation. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. It's a compiled book. It's not just one book. It's not just the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I believe God Almighty suggests tonight that if we as God's people uh, are going to mend the breach of the wall, uh, if we're going to heal this land, hey, we'll have to get a hold and receive the engrafted word of God. James said you better get rid of all that superfilly of naughtiness. You better clean up your lifestyle and receive the engrafted word of God. Hey, I'm telling you, the word of God is hard to find in these last days. We can't even define it in these last days. There's an argument among our circles. What Bible's the right Bible? 10% error in the King James and such talk. My hind leg, by the way, bless God. I'm talking about, friend, what shall the righteous do? What can the righteous do? We can receive the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible said, and how shall they believe on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
I'm telling you, preaching is a vanishing practice. These overhead projectors and crayons, look up in here. These missionaries on Sunday and Wednesday nights about stolen preacher's time in the pulpit. What we need is to hear the word of God. Notice what he said. Let us hear. Hey man, I like that. Let us hear. I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to get under some preaching if we're going to have any salvage of this nation in these days. When the world in its wisdom knew not God. That said it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Oh, Paul told Timothy, if you're going to pastor that church down there at Ephesus where I fought that wild beast. He said, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. He said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke and then exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come and the time has come. When they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from truth unto fables. We live there tonight, even in our circles, preaching. God help me. Most of these graduates from Bible college ain't got enough fire to warm a chicken speed. Say amen. Little sermonette for the Christianette, dressed like a majorette, driving that Corvette. Somebody help me. Amen. Dearly beloved brethren, we gathered here this morning to worship. It's called reproving and rebuking. Two thirds of my responsibility as a pastor of the Middle Tennessee Baptist Church, and as the Lord's opened the doors for me to do the work for the evangelist, two thirds of my obligation is negative preaching, reproving and rebuking. Then exhorting. Oh, we specialize. I've got a lot of preacher friends. They glory preachers. But you know, we need more than the glory. We need the glory every now and then, friend. Amen. Preaching. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. As a steward, the Bible said, hey, we got to be faithful to preach the whole counsel of God's word. This selective preaching. I wouldn't give you five cents for a preacher who preach one thing at this conference and another one at the next one. Amen, bless God. Preach the word. We got to hear it. We must emphasize. I thank God for the premium that the Bible puts on Holy Ghost, optionized preaching. Preaching still works, friend. I got saved under preaching. I got called under preaching. And I'm telling you, thank God for a man of God who stands up consistently and preaches what thus saith the Lord. What shall the righteous do? We got to receive the word. You got to hear it. I think this, we need to harbor it. We've developed a congregation of people that pride themselves on how they can handle preaching. Boy, I'll tell you, my crowd can take preaching. Well, man, being a hearer is nothing unless there's doers that follow. The Bible said, not be a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. And by the way, there's a great weight of responsibility that accompanies hearing the word of God. The Bible said, for whom much is given, to whom much is given, much is required. This crowd I'm addressing tonight has been given a rich heritage. I mean, friends, look up in here. Some of you have been raised up in a Christian home. You've went every day of your life under Christian education. You've had the best of the best across this platform. The places you come from, the hamlets and hallways that you've been preached the gospel. Hey, the best of the best of God's men. And to whom much is given, much is required. There's never been a nation who's had more good preaching than America. In these last 300 years... Look up here, bless God. The word of God, we've been rich. We've been rich and fat on preaching. We better harbor it. The Bible said, Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereto according to that word. We better heed it too. You better start practicing what you hear. Receive the word of God. He said, let us 
hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And then he said, fear God. Those are two good words. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of God. I never thought I would see it in our circles where the fear of man has become such a great snare on us. It's amazing how intimidated we are by the brethren. I like what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He said, we labor, whether absent or present, that we may be accepted of him. Oh, Paul was looking for God Almighty's approval on his life. Brethren today so desire camaraderie. We so desire an encouraging word. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You better start looking for the approval of God. Fear God. There's an undermining today that's caused the destruction we're experiencing. There's an undermining of the authority of God. There's an undermining of the power of God, of the position of God, of the purpose of God. There's an undermining today. Honestly, we've let psychiatrists and psychologists in 12 steps take the place of an altar. I remember when a drunk man get on him bones down there and call on God and come up sober as a judge came up. Amen. Long for all these extracurricular activities and Friday night beatings was coming on. Look up in here. Hey, old time mourners benches. I'm talking about old time, old time repentance. It was getting the job done for him. We've undermined the power. We got to help God out. We got to help God out. We get sick. We got to help God out. Barley green. Vitamins. People start getting over cancer. They start bragging on vitamin C like it cured them. Look up in here. Don't bow your head. I'm not ready to pray yet. Acts 10, 13 is my favorite passage. Kill it, eat. Kill and eat. I say kill it and grill it, bless God. Amen. Long as God makes hogs, hey, I'm eating them. There'll come a time in the last days, in those days of demolished foundations, when they'll refuse and abstain from eating meats. Because they fear their doctor, they fear their doctor. I'm not saying be careless. Now watch me. But I'll never forget my daddy diagnosed with cancer. Man, he was trying everything. In sincerity, he got on one of those diets drinking carrot juice till he turned orange. <laughs> and still had cancer. Don't get mad. Look up in here. You get glad the same breaches you got mad in. It's my time to preach. Yeah. And I was preaching before I come and I'll be preaching it when I leave out of here. Bless God. Yeah. I'll never forget he called me, Dr. Treber, and he said, said, son, I want us to go get breakfast. And I thought, oh, God, help get breakfast. I could see it some kind of a oats. <laughs> with raw shredded carrots on top of it. Organically grown, of course. I thought, Daddy, I, I'm not that hungry. He said, come on, son. <laughs> Trying to force pineapple, ca cabbage. He, he, he said, you ought to try this. This is a new drink. Got that juicer going. Pineapple, carrot, cabbage. And broccoli juice. I'd rather drink muddy water than live in a holler log, bless God. Amen. And we got in the car. We, I said, where are we going? He said, down the road here. I was going, oh, I was thinking of all the wretched health food, nutritional, gag tasting places I'd been before. And then finally he said, hold up, son. He said, whoop in over at this Cracker Barrel. And I... I got the feeling something on that. I said, Cracker Barrel? He said, yeah. We went in there. He ordered the country boy. That's three scrambled eggs any way you want them. 
asked salt ham or city ham. And he said, I want mine cured, real salty. And it's so salty, you eat a piece of it, you'll drink water for three days. Are y'all listening to me? <laughs> he didn't get wheat toast. He got them biscuits made with lard, bless God. Look up in here just a minute. Who are you fearing? Who are you fearing? We've gotten to a place honest to God. There's an undermining of God. It's appointed on a man wants to die. If God gave you, look up and if God gave you some sausage, you better fry it, bless God. <laughs> Amen, right there. Amen. The fear of man's a snare. When we see here the respect of God, I believe these last days we better put more stock in what God thinks. How does God assess your progress? Does God's measuring stick, what does God's uh, measuring stick say about your ministry? Oh, well, I, I, we're running. I tell you about that. We're running. We're running. How many of y'all run? I said, we don't run anybody. Most people in our church are real heavy. <laughs> they walk. <laughs> I'll never forget. I went to a meeting, a fellowship meeting, and, and a preacher said, now, what's the per capita giving of your church? I said, no, nah, man, we don't have that problem. We already had our shots. Say Amen. <laughs> It's amazing how we're impressed. And by the way, you might as well tell the truth because when somebody visits your church on Sunday night, all that baptizing 10,000 last year, and you ain't got but 25 on Sunday night, something wrong somewhere. It reveals your fear of man. Our nation has lost the fear of God. We're so politically correct. I'm telling you in these last days, I, we've reached such a low in our desire to please the Almighty. He says, fear God. We ought to develop a fear of God in our children. And God we trust. That ought to be more than just, a, just words on a coin. That ought to be a practice of God's people. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. I believe if we're going to survive the righteous in the last days during a day of crumbling foundations, we're going to have to receive, we're going to have to respect, but we're going to have to resolve. Everybody that believes his commandments. But let me help you just a little bit. When you start getting specific about this stuff, everybody can't be right. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Soul winning, for instance. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Somebody's right about this thing. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Psalms 126, 5. He that sows in tears shall reap in joy, and he that goeth forth and weepeth and pairing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong about this thing. Somebody's right about the work of God. He's given commandments. The only alternative from confrontational soul winning is disobedience of the Great Commission. You understand? That's the only choice. Go into all the world and preach a gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Hey, it's not an option, it's a command. There's a crowd today that's backing up on it, you know. Well, I just, I'm scared of that easy believism. Well, wait just a minute. Tell me what hard believism is. I hear, hey, well, I, yeah, we, we had 10 saved on the, but how many was really saved? You've heard that talk. That's confusing talk, by the way. It's like running over, if I run over a possum tonight. Well, out here, armadillo, I guess. 
He's dead. You hit him with a 12 and a half, 33 mud tire, he's dead. When his tail starts cranking and eyes roll back in his head, he's dead. He's a dead armadillo. I come back a week later and he's swelling up. Buzzards are circling him. I'd say he really did. Come back four weeks later and they've done picked his bones clean. I say he got an old fashioned case of death. No, no, he was just as dead when the tire hit him. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Aggressive soul winning is a scriptural practice. Amen. They that turn many to righteousness shall shine. I don't understand the excuse we're given on obedience. It's a command. Amen. Until we turn our welcome mats to we'll go mats, we're not going to see a lot of growth in the church. Lasting growth in the church. When it comes to his work, when it comes to worship, somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Don't get nervous. I don't understand people downplaying that word worship. I don't understand that talk. He's seeking them to worship him. In spirit and in truth, if we're two or three gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of them. Amen. I'm talking about old time Holy Ghost. Old fashioned worship. We got so far from it now. Most of this crowd, most of our young people don't know what conviction is. I was preaching in a teen camp back in Georgia a couple of years ago. I'll never forget as long as I have a familiar man. If I said his name, most of you know him. 260 something kids in this teen camp. First night of the meeting. Is everybody listening? I ain't making it up. I got witnesses. First night of the meeting, I said, how many of y'all remember getting under conviction before you got saved? Every person in there was a Christian school student. The counselors were graduates from our Bible colleges. And they got to look at it other like, like I was talking in a foreign language. Now, I know when I go up north, a lot of times I need an interpreter. But this was in Georgia. I was speaking, I was speaking their natural dialect. Amen. They got to look at it. And I said, raise your hand if you remember getting under conviction. And one preacher on the platform, the host pastor, and two of the workers, and the rest of them still didn't know what I'm talking about. There's something wrong with that. John R. Rice, our hero, John R. Rice. I got it marked in his book where he said his biggest fear of 20th century Christianity was conversion without conviction. Don't you remember when the Holy Ghost worked on you before you got saved? And my heart would just be. And preach that we're going to sing one more verse. If nobody responds, this will be the last. And I say, oh God, I hope nobody responds. My heart's beating my throat. I got, I got my heart and I a, a knot in my throat. I couldn't swallow. I'd be under convictions. I, I, I got to the habit. I'd, I'd tug my mom on this and say, mom, go, I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. She said, well, go ahead. And what I'd do, I'd go straight through the foyer and I'd go out through the front doors of the church. I'd go out to them two big oak trees at Forest Hills Baptist Church with them deacons out there smoking cigarettes. I knew if I could just get if, it, if I could just get a good draw of that second hand Winston, it'd break that conviction. I've been doing it for them deacons for years. Somebody say amen. Man, I'd go through that for you. Oh yeah. Year after year. I'll never forget the night my mama looked down when I tugged on that dress. I said, Mama, I got to go to the bathroom. She said, Son, it ain't your kidneys you got a problem with. It's your heart. We got, hey, we signing these cards and popping that gum. Look up in here. People come down, want to make a profession of faith. Now, the Lord did save you, didn't he? You did ask the Lord into your heart, didn't you? Hey, if he gets saved, you won't have to give him the answers. Hey, if somebody gets born again, look up in here. You won't have to give them the answers. Hey, you won't have to give them the answers, friend. They'll know something happened. You can feel it in your soul. Bless God. Amen. 
We've gotten so distant from the thing. I mean, we've let these charismatics scare us from the Holy Ghost. And, and let, me, let me just interject right here. He's not the third person of the Godhead. I tell you why the foundation has been destroyed. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. We're scared of God. We're scared of the Holy Ghost. I'm 10,000 miles from a charismatic. I'm a fundamental, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a biblical fundamentalist. But I ain't a scared of the Holy Ghost. He's no third person of the Godhead. You don't minimize the role that the Holy Ghost plays. He's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's the comforter. He's that paraclete. He's that one that walks along beside, friend. Hey, in him we live. And in him we move. And in him we have our being. Most churches, Baptist churches I preach in, are dry as cracker juice. As cold as an iceberg. Got to skate up and down the aisles. Dead music. Thank God, man. Thank God for something you can feel. Look up here. Y'all tell me all you want to. Now, I, I just don't wait for that emotion. Well, who do you think made you? Was we made in the image of the devil? Who made you? Hey, some of you had to keep, sit on your hands to keep from raising them when Martinez was singing a while ago. Say amen, bless God. That Statue of Liberty got on me, amen. Amen. We legislate him. We put him on a time clock. Well, you just don't understand our ministry is a unique ministry. How come everybody wants to, wants to bypass clear scriptural practices, call it a unique circumstance? Amen. I wouldn't send a dog to a Bible college you couldn't praise God at. If I had a Shetland pony, look up in here. I wouldn't send him to a Bible college you couldn't praise. I wouldn't send him to learn woe, look up in here, to a Bible college you couldn't praise God in. By the way, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I want my wife and my daughters to like coming to church. Can I get a witness, somebody? Everybody take a big, deep breath and say it's going to be all right. It's preaching time. Since the foundations have been destroyed, God help us, we better obey his commandments. The Bible says that everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. The Bible said come before his presence with singing and in his courts with praise, friend. Hey, long before these praise and worship leaders came on the scene, long before this look up at the theatrical productions came on the scene, hey, God's people were lifting their voice in song huh, and shouting the praises of God. Hey, and it ain't gone out of style. It's just gone out of practice. It's still biblical. It's still scriptural. Hey, look, don't, don't question me on it because what I know about the Bible, I don't know all of it, but the parts I know, I know real good. Resolve. Resolve about the work of God. Resolve about the worship of God. Keep his commandments about the word of God. Can I just interject right here and I got to hurry because my sermons are really long. John R. Rice said, ain't no man's 30-minute message going to do what my hour message will do. Amen, friend. I don't know enough about manuscript evidence. And look up in here, scholar, you don't either. I don't know how to argue with all these people. I know a little Greek and a little Hebrew, y'all know. The little Greek runs a restaurant, the little Hebrew runs a clothing store. I have a hard time with English. I have a hard time with English. Are y'all listening? I pastor in Tennessee, so it don't matter much about my English. But I'm going to help y'all with all this. Is it preserved or inspired? 
going to help y'all. I'm going to help y'all with this. Let a country man help y'all with something. I don't care what you want to call it. If you're holding the King James Bible in your lap, you're holding a miracle. I don't understand how they can believe the miracles of the Bible, but they can't believe the miracle of the Bible. Who would want to spawn controversy over the authenticity of the Bible? I don't understand that. Under the sanctions of academia, trying to impress some crowd. Look up in here. Hey, that's where the gap theory come in. Bless God. Is everybody okay? Is everybody all right? Hey, I'm talking about this Bible's the written word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's proper for doctrine that tells you what is right. For reproof that tells you what's not right. For correction that tells me how to get it right. For instruction that tells me how to keep it right. That the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you got a King James, you got a miracle. That's enough for me. What shall the righteous do? Well, we're going to have to receive. We're going to have to respect. We're going to have to resolve. But notice these words in verse 14. And that's where I came to preach. Praise God. That's all introduction. <laughs> For God shall bring ever work into judgment. With ever secret thing. Whether it be good or whether it be evil. What shall the righteous do? Give you a word right here and we'll be through in a little while. God's people are going to have to remember. The God the world paints is the Santa Claus. Now y'all know I believe in Santa Claus. I am Santa Claus. <laughs> For the homeschoolers here, look, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Watch this. But he ain't no old man up in the North Pole, our God. He's no decrepit, ancient papa with a long white beard and legs crossed sitting on the front porch. Be not deceived. God is not more. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, and of the flesh reap corruption. If he sows to the spirit, he'll of the spirit reap life everlasting. Amen. Be not deceived, he's a just God. And the mills of God's justice may grind mercifully slow. But the mills of God's justice are surely grinding this very hour. If God doesn't do something to America, he's got to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm no Jeremiah Wright, but 9-11, I believe with all my heart, is an act of God. It's amazing how we were brought to our knees so quickly. I pastor a church in a college town, the largest enrollment in the state of Tennessee, Middle Tennessee State University, had 29,000 students enrolled last year. 9-11 came, I'll never forget it. They were knocking on our church doors, the students who are normally party animals, Students by the hundreds were knocking on our church doors. Would you let us use your sanctuary to pray? I'm not talking about a few. I'm talking about long-haired hippies. And, and then what you call it, that crowd got that hair. Look, all of it. Uh, when it's all. Yeah, I thought you'd know. <laughs> Sir. Got you. He bit. They're on our altars. But it didn't take long to forget. Let's have a moment of silence in memory of the loss of our 
Comrades, let's, let's pray for the grieving families. But it didn't last long. Say what you will. Sin City, New Orleans, it's underwater. That's no coincidence. The hand of God. Hey, more gambling going on around that Mississippi and Louisiana. But they're back to the same old. Until God blows again. And then everybody, oh, let's pray that the, that the levees hold. So we can stay here in a sodomite lifestyle. And continue our anti-Christian home agenda. And propagate gambling and drugs and illicit effects. Hey, let's just, let's just wait. A, oh God, pray, pray in the past. We don't remember long. But you don't either. We all hop on that wagon. You right, preach on right there. But what about your life? God's people better remember. Do y'all remember, I'm not that old as some of you are much older. Maybe I'm old to some of you students. But when I grew up, preachers used the word wicked a lot. I remember preachers just, I mean, just like, just get up. Wicked! It's wicked! It's wicked! They use statements like this, straight out of hell. By the way, John the Baptist didn't get his head cut off for some little old uh, Sunday school lesson. He said, Herod, you wicked thing, you shack it up. You a whoremonger. Do you know it's still wicked? <laughs> Judgment of God. We better remember he said God shall bring every work into judgment. The judgment of God is a sure judgment. If there's anything you can count on, be sure your sins will find you out. Look up in here, some of you that are flirting with this internet pornography. Pulpits are vacant all across America because of the judgment of the God of the Bible found it out. Unfaithfulness in the home. You better be careful. You think you're getting over? You're not getting over. There's an old song we used to sing in the Red Book at home. You cannot do wrong and get by. There wasn't no glory in that song. I remember singing that song as a teenager and I'm talking about everything I'd done that day would flash through my mind. There's a lot of things, good neighbor, look up in here. There's a lot of things that I did I should not have done as a child. But there's a lot of things I could have done that I did not do because I was scared of the judgment of God. the judgment. We sweep such sin under the rug. Rationalize and condone. Remember the judgment of God is sure. Remember the judgment of God is speedy. Every work's going to be revealed and our life's coming quickly. It's a vapor. Which appears for a short time. I'm going to tell you what we're going to do right for God we better get busy about now. And what you're going to correct in your life, those things that are omitted and those things that have been committed that don't belong there. Hey, you better do something about it now. I wouldn't wait another hour. If the foundations be destroyed, huh? what shall the righteous do? Hey, you better remember God ain't playing. The God of this Bible, he ain't playing. Specific judgment. Well, my daddy's a good man. 
Every man. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We labor, the uh, Bible said, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man will give an account of the things done in his body, whether it be good or be evil. Every man. Well, my parents are godly people. What about you? Can you imagine at the beam of seat? Can you imagine at that elevated place and we're going to, by the way, and you're being judged now. It's not just then, you are being judged now. If you judge yourselves, you'll not be judged. You're being judged now. Can you imagine standing before God now, Lord, uh, I just want to say one word before we get into this. You go ahead. You probably knew my daddy, Curtis Hudson. He knew John Rice and Jack Howells well. <laughs> you know, Baptists are name droppers. Look up here. Every missionary I meet, an evangelist, I spoke for so and so. Just let God open your doors, by the way. Thought I'd throw that out. You know old Curtis Hudson? He'll say, hold up a minute. No, we're looking for Tony Curtis Hudson. You're going to look to God eyeball to eyeball one day, and you're going to give an account of the opportunities that you had and the opportunities you wasted. The opportunities that you neglected. The privileges that you had to serve him. I'm going to tell you something. You better remember. If the foundations be destroyed. I'm not going to say that we're living in failed churches. But I'm saying we're living in failing churches. I'm not going to say every home has failed. Thank God there's some godly families still left. But yours could be a casualty. Don't think you're not under attack. You say, Brother Tony, are you down on America? No, no, no. I thank God I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. With all of her problems, she's still the best place to be. Especially if you live in Tennessee. Amen. But it's been destroyed. It's not the same America I grew up in. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you to be honest tonight.